Hello and welcome to the world of NDE 4.0. My name is Johannes Frane and today is a great day. Because today we will be taking an excursion to the world of ultrasonics. As I promised in the introduction video, we'll not only be talking about NDE 4.0 and all the emerging technologies connected to Industry 4.0, but we will also be talking about all the different NDE methods, about the basics of all the different NDE methods. And for that today, we will actually begin with a little bit of an excursion on the history of ultrasonic testing. So we will be yeah, taking a step back to the world of NDE 2.0. Let's get started. If you look into the beginnings of ultrasonics, into the very basic, you quickly see that there are two uh, inventions which are really important for ultrasound. That's on the one side the magnetostrictive effect and the piezoelectric effect, because both of them actually are the ones which allow to produce transducers. All the probes we currently use, that's the basics for it. Also, and that, that was in about the same time frame, Lord Rayleigh wrote a book about yeah, the theory of sound. And this was the first time that somebody described actually a sound wave as a mathematical equation. So this is also very basic for our ultrasonics. Now, the first application came around 1912. On the 15th of April 1912, Titanic sank. It was 1,000. It took 1,517 dead people until somebody got the idea that perhaps putting somebody on top of a mass in the middle of the night, looking out there, freezing to death, and looking for an iceberg, that this might not be the best idea. And Right in the same year, actually, Mr. Richardson filed a patent for an underwater echo ranging system. And already in 1914, they had the first iceberg, underwater iceberg detection system using ultrasonics. Yeah, they had it working. However, in that time frame, yeah, the focus shifted a little bit from the detection of icebergs to the detection of submarines. So now, during the First World War, they used ultrasonics for the so-called sonar system, sound navigation and ranging, yeah, to find those, the enemy submarines. Finally, in 1928, somebody proposed for the first time to use ultrasonics for non-destructive material testing. And that was Sergei Sokolov. And what he proposed is using ultrasonics in the through transmission technique. So not like the pulse echo we know nowadays, but one receiver on one side, one receive or one sender on one side, the receiver on the other side, and then having through transmission. And not pulsed, but continuous wave. So not sending one short pulse and then waiting for the response. No, having a continuous wave and then seeing, okay, does it, is it being altered by the material? So a little bit different idea than what we currently do, but it was clearly the idea to test materials. In that paper, he also wrote a sentence. If a glass with small living fishes is put into a mercury bath with the generator, the fishes became exciting. And using a strong ultrasonic excitation, they were killed instantly. So we are not talking about Schrodinger's cat anymore. We are talking about Sokolov's fishes. Actually, in an upcoming video, I will also be talking about Schrodinger's cat at what point, but here we are talking about Sokolov's fishes. So the concept was proposed, but it took the next war, the next catastrophe in human evolution actually to bring NDE or to bring ultrasonics really into being one of the most important NDE methods on the planet. During the Second World War, all of the parties wanted to make their tanks, their military equipment safer, especially for the people sitting inside of them. 
So they were looking for methods, okay, how can we find inclusions in the material or inhomogeneities or whatever. And every party within the Second World War came up with their own ultrasonic testing solution, completely independent. And there it was Mr. Firestone from, yeah, from the USA, Mr. Sproul from the United Kingdom, and there was also um, somebody from Germany, um, Mr. Trost, Arnold Trost, um, with the Trost tongue. Um, and all three of them changed how ultrasonics was done a little bit. Number one, they went to a pulse echo method, and number two, from a yeah continuous wave to a pulsed excitation. Mr. Firestone used one probe on the component for both sending and receiving, so what we currently would call a single crystal. Mr. Sproul used a dual crystal, both crystals at the same side, so today, nowadays we'll call it the dual crystal. Um, and the German attempt was a little bit more engineered, perhaps a little bit over-engineered. It was a big tongue or two tongues which you pressed against the material from one from each side to record the signal. Yeah. But all three of them worked really good. And that's why after the Second World War, when it became, yeah, public that those methods were around, they became inter interesting for all the industry. And this is, for example, the Sperry supersonic reflectoscope from Mr. Firestone. You can see it's already kind of portable, even that it is, yeah, really huge. I wouldn't want to carry it around with me in my car. And that was about one of the first commercially available systems. A couple of years, besides now Sperry and Hughes, those two companies interacting with Mr. Firestone and Mr. Stroll, there were a couple of other companies producing first commercial pulse echo instruments like Krautkramer, Karl Deutsch, Siemens. And up here you can see a, an image of a Siemens ultrasonic instrument from back then. And what I really like about this one is actually how they put this screenshot camera right in front of the screen so that you were able to actually capture your findings right away. They already thought back then about, okay, how can we do the documentation in the best possible way? Even though they didn't have any digital technology or NDE 4.0. Okay, so, and this actually led right away to the first applications. This was really a quick starter, for example, in the forging industry, which I know pretty good because I worked in the forging industry a couple of years, and you will be seeing a couple of forging examples actually in my upcoming ultrasonic presentations. But in the forging business, yeah, the first applications became available around 1951, so just five years after the first commercially available instruments. And here you can see this gentleman in his neat white uh, color inspecting this forging. And you see how huge those components are. By the way, they are not, it's not just a thin, a thin skin. This is a complete volume inspection. This component is completely filled with steel. Those components can be up to something like 20 meters, two meters in diameter, 200 tons of weight. And within those components, with current ultrasonics, it's not really an issue to find a material imperfection of the size of about one millimeter. So speaking about the needle in the haystack, that's exactly what we are doing. And you can see how back in the days, back in 1951, they used this ultrasonic instrument with the screen capturing uh, camera right in front of it to inspect this forging. Back then it was a pure radial inspection and what we will be seeing over that this changed over the year. But the ultrasonic inspection is even nowadays done in about the same way. We're taking perhaps a few more probes, not just a straight beam, but also some angle beams and going also in an axial direction. But 
Besides that, it's about done the same. So, thanks a lot. Thanks for taking this excursion to the world of ultrasonics. If you have any comments, as usual, please write them down in the comments. Next time, I will be talking about the basics of ultrasonics. Now, that's true for this playlist. On the playlist for NDE 4.0, we will be talking about the digital twin. So, I will develop now both of them at the same time, perhaps one week the one, one week the other. If you want me to actually focus on one or the other, please tell me down in the comments. As usual, you will find more information in the description. I hope you like this video. I hope you subscribe to this channel. I hope you give me a thumbs up. I hope I will see you soon. Thank you for watching. See you soon. Thanks and bye.